Welcome to the Business Podcast, where we interview professionals across all industries. And today we have Anu Shukla, a serial entrepreneur and co-founder of several ventures, most recently, Botco.ai. Anu, thanks for joining us. How are you? I'm great, and thank you for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. So Anu, just to kick off, can you share with us a bit about your background and in particular, something that people can't easily find by Googling you or looking you up on social media? Okay. Um, well, I'm a senior entrepreneur, as you mentioned earlier on. I, I actually yeah. work for a whole, uh, whole bunch of companies in here in the Silicon Valley until I founded my own first company, which was uh, uh, Rubrik. It was, it was uh, one of the pioneers of marketing automation, sort of created that category. Uh-huh. So I've done about five venture-backed companies. And uh, I'm currently a venture partner at a um, venture firm called Elevate.vc. And I really, and the reason is because I really love their mission. And their mission is to really fund, uh, you know, non, um, you know, founders that are underrepresented, which are usually Black, Latin, Latinx, women, LGBTQ founders. Mm-hmm. And so I really like that mission. And, and, uh, and actually, we've been very true to that. This is the second fund. So I really wanted to join. And I get a chance to help those founders and share my uh, experiences with them and, and ensure their success. So it's kind of a new role for me. But the bulk of my time is really spent on uh, Botcoder AI's a new baby. And um, it's, really try- it's really pioneering, again, I believe, um, you know, turning uh, conversations into clients uh, and really beefing up the marketing automation toolbox so that is that is what i'm um, uh, you know involved in and something about myself that you wouldn't find out from googling uh well i don't think you'd find out you would find out that i am a uh, proud mother of twins a boy and a girl oh wow i had that yeah i had that lottery come through for me one time one shot (laughs) <laughs> congratulations and they yeah they pretty they keep me pretty busy they are little teenagers right now and so it's going on i think they're uh so this finishing up sophomore year and becoming juniors at high school so that's something that you probably may not find out uh by googling me oh fantastic uh well thanks for sharing that that's really uh that's really unique uh especially the fact that they're boy and girl and they're twins that's that's yeah. wonderful I'm sure they keep you busy. They do. Yes. They are the joy of my life, but also they keep me very busy. <laughs> yeah. Well, congrats again. Um, so when it comes to your domain of expertise, can you share a piece of wisdom that you've learned? Um, so in my domain of expertise that I, I guess that would be marketing or I guess that would be being a serial entrepreneur, right? And I think that what I've learned is that this, what you do in the early stages of the company is a little bit different from what you do when the company has become a little big, right? Yeah. And um, what um, it's hard to quantify into too many words, but I think the focus on early stage companies needs to, in, in companies is what I've learned is that it needs to be uh, about uh, getting things done. Like you literally yourself have to make sure things are getting finished because there's nobody really to delegate to. So you really have to, you know, you really have to pick the right things to, to execute and finish. Um, and that Absolutely. is really different in bigger companies. In bigger companies, you can discuss things for a while and, and it sort of spreads out and somebody's taking care of it and it'll get done someday. And in, in small companies, you have to take ownership and get things done. That's, that's one thing in early stage startups. And then as you start to grow, like it's very important that you hire like really great people and you hire very, take your time hiring the right people, but, but really don't be afraid to admit that it's not working out and, and fire quickly. You shouldn't fire, you shouldn't take a long time firing people. You mm-hmm. should take a long time hiring people, but you should fire quickly because it's just a waste of everybody's time. And it kind of spoils it for, for the whole team dynamic. So those, those are, I think, a couple of things that I've picked up from being involved with early stage companies, very, very early stage, seed stage companies, and what you have to do differently 
as compared to when you are a little bit bigger and a little bit more mature. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So with that in mind, what would you say, especially throughout the course of this year, has been something that uh, you've, you've acquired as a, as a lesson that stood out? This year? Yeah, over the course of the last year. Um, well, you know, uh, you know, in, in, so this, so the last year and this year has been very much focused on Bartco. Yeah. Um, obviously, since I'm a co-founder and it's an early stage company, um, and you know, you have to get things done. And I focus very much on the hiring front. So many of our employees, we've never met them. Uh, it's all been on Zoom, and yet we, uh, I would say, doubled and tripled the size of our company because we started very small, right? So we literally doubled the size of a company during COVID and did all our hiring remotely without a lot of resources. And yet we ended up with really great people. So I think uh, that that was something, obviously you learn a lot when you do that. Like you learn to read what the, you know, if people don't have their camera on, what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> what's the problem? And you learn to look at their background, I guess, and say, is this person organized or not? We can often tell from the way where they're sitting because they're sitting in their homes and if there's a big fat mess at the back, you're like, this person lives in so much clutter. You know, how do they get anything done? So they all these like Zoom tips we've had to pick up and learn uh, that, you you know, because we, we can't meet them. We can't, you know, take them out for lunch. We can't shake their hand. We can't have them come to the office and meet multiple people. It's all Zoom. So you have to figure out who this person is what is their intelligence, integrity, devotion? Can we trust them? You know, based entirely on their, um, you know, Zoom presence. And so we've learned to read that, I guess. Oh, that's phenomenal. Have there been any interesting takeaways uh, that you've gleaned outside of what you already mentioned, paying attention to the background uh, and seeing how organized it is? Uh, any Anything else that has stood out to you? Um, you know, um, it's uh, it's always, you know, um, I, I thought I would be very clear, but when I used to set up my first interviews with, um, with candidates, and I did a lot of recruiting this last year, mm. uh, I would be, you know, saying we're going to have a Zoom call, and they would come and they would say, well, the cameras were off. And, uh, and I was like, well, put your camera on. And they're like, well, you know, I didn't know I was going to have a camera on, so I'm not in a good place or my camera isn't working. Uh, and, um, and I was like, wow, you're interviewing for like a job that's six figures and your camera is not working and it's COVID, we're not gonna have you travel anywhere. So why wouldn't you have your camera on, right? So yeah. it, it just seemed like it was so obvious Like the only way I'm gonna to get to know you is by talking to you on camera. Yeah. You're never going to travel, in, you know, till we hire, until COVID is over, we're not going to meet each other. And you're going to have this wonderful job and you're going to be working from your home office. So I need to know what your home office looks like. And I want to, know, is it comfortable? Is it quiet? Is it a professional environment? Or do I need to help you find you uh, some other place, which is not possible in COVID. And then also I need to know who you are just from this camera interview. So it seemed to me very obvious that they should keep their camera on, but a remarkable number of people did not or weren't terribly prepared to be on camera. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, you're not gonna walk in with a baseball cap because your hair is not looking good, you know, in a real interview, right? You're not gonna wear a, a suit and a baseball cap, right? So why would you do that on a Zoom call? So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you saw that in an interview. I did, and I was like, okay. Baseball cap man, you know, you're a customer success manager. How are you going to go to a customer and you don't care what you look like, right? Yeah. So like I said, I learned so much during COVID because I just learned how to judge people or know them or, you know, just on all these nonverbal cues and, um, and, and things like that on Zoom and how to hire them and how, then how to work with them and collaborate with them and make sure that everybody has the right motivations. You can't be watching them. Uh, so you, you need people that are self-motivated and are delivering, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what would you say has been one of the biggest challenges in your career? Uh, one of the biggest challenges in my career has been like, um, 
but there's so many challenges, right? Uh, but the challenges are always around, um, you know, putting together the right team behind the right idea, and then uh, creating enough momentum to get funding, and then finding, making sure you have the right product market fit. So product market fit, you know, is, is really important. Um, uh, and it kind of leads to the momentum that drives companies. So I think that it's, it's really hard. Sometimes you don't have it and you have to pivot. And that pivoting is always like hard. So I think, you know, when you start out with a mission and then for a variety of reasons that are not in your control, maybe the market, maybe you didn't have it right in the first place. Sure. Maybe the market changed. For whatever reason, you have to pivot and there isn't a product, just making that switch because you're so wedded to your idea that to pivot, it just, I mean, I always admire the people that started out doing something and then ended up doing something else because yeah. that is a huge move. So I think pivots are really difficult and just require like guts of steel and you really have the ability to give up something that you really believed in and pursue something else and having and doing all of that with a limited time and limited budget those are always hard. I've done a few of those uh, in my career, and those have been really hard. Well, oh, that's uh, that's a really good insight. Really ensuring that you take your idea from the validation stage to the market fit stage, and to actually having it uh, generate the kind of traction needed for it to be investment grade, or mm -hmm. to show those those uh, potential, uh, you know. Uh, inklings of, of success down the road. So with that in mind, Anu, um, what would you say has been an inflection point or series, if you want to share, of inflection points that have changed the course of your career? I think that, uh, oh, there's, there's been a few that I always remember those fondly. Um, so I remember that I uh, moved from a city that I was in um, to another city for a job, um, which I don't do anymore, but I used to, mm -hmm. I did it once. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it really, and I moved from like, um, from a hardware oriented world to a so completely software and I never looked back. So that was really important to me. Um, and then being able to, uh, work for this company and scale them, uh, to the point where they got acquired for a lot of money, six, $700 million as being part of the executive team. That, that was very important. And then I did it a few times and then I, I uh, realized that I think maybe I was ready to do it for myself. And so a big inflection point for me was when I started my first company. You see, I was a very successful and uh, well-known um, B2B uh, marketing and product uh, vice president mm -hmm. in fairly large companies. And I was getting recruited like crazy by other very big companies that were offering me very attractive salary packages sure. uh, to make me come and do the same thing for them, which I had successfully demonstrated maybe at a competitor who got bought or went public. They're like, hey, come, you can do this for us. And you, know, you can have this title and we give you this much money. And um, all those companies turned out to be very successful. And uh, I was offered like good positions in those companies. And I decided to start my own company. So I decided mm -hmm. to go you know, to a loft in San Francisco with my co-founder who I just met and another co-founder that I had worked with for a long time and create a category of software for marketing people. So in, to be as successful at my job as a VP of marketing for B2B companies, I created a system for myself to be able to, you know, manage my budget, create leads for salespeople, mm -hmm. to track the budget to its effectiveness, and so on and so forth. So, um, I, I you know, that's a system that I created, you know, in, in sort of a ad hoc way, manual way for myself, with spreadsheets and and uh, small pieces of software. And I decided that it was a whole category that other VPs of marketing would want, mm -hmm. uh, and it would make them successful. So. You know, we were in a loft and we um, weren't taking any salaries. In fact, we put some money into the company to build out just the first HTML demo click-through version. We talked to over a hundred companies to validate our ideas. I called my peers, 
you know, all the other VPs of marketing and I asked them, hey, if I build this, would you buy it? I saw, you know, they said, yes, you know, they would very much be interested in it. Wow. Because literally I was taking everything that I'd learned that had made me successful, I was putting into them. We created some new concepts that were not heard of. So first of all, when we went to venture capitalists, they said, oh, you're doing marketing automation. Isn't that an oxymoron? And look at it now, it's like a multi-billion dollar industry and everybody has to have marketing automation software. Yeah. So at that time, they thought it was an oxymoron. Uh, and then, um, you know, I um, managed to uh, I managed to raise money for that company anyway. Sure. And uh, it, it, it really created, started the snowball effect of creating a category. So things that we hear about now, like, you know, lead nurturing or drip marketing, we actually invented it and codified it in software for the first time. And um, so, I, so I think those are the things that, uh, you know, that I remember that I think we did successfully. Yeah, that's phenomenal. I mean, you think of the infusion softs of the world, or you think of the marketos of the world, and uh, all the marketing terms. Uh, it's it's fascinating to know that you you played a significant role in uh, the the genesis of some of those really well known companies. Now, that's yes, I mean we were definitely came before them, and they knew about us, and uh, I think they evolved with time, and they had something, you know different and better for their own audiences but some of those core ideas uh, of things like drip marketing at least those were first found in rubric which is a software we created and we're trying to do that with um, with botquay right now i mean the similarities are when we did rubric we were really leveraging new platform of internet internet and email were actually new and hadn't been used successfully for marketing and then we built it in java which was like new at that time and we leverage all these new technologies uh, to really create a, a, a really compelling piece of uh, software. And we're doing that right now because things like artificial intelligence and natural language processing and machine learning have not been properly applied to marketing applications, especially using interactive chat. So you know, conversations, so how do you turn conversations into clients is what we're all about. And in order to do that, we're we're literally creating a new platform and bringing a lot of new things to bear, new technologies to solve that problem. So in that, that is what the similarity I see between what, um, what uh, Botco AI is trying to do and, and, and uh, what uh, Rubrik did in its, in its day. Hmm. Well, that's, that's definitely exciting. And uh, on that note, what's getting you excited lately? Um, what's getting me, I mean, right now we're in the throes, we're growing, uh, you know, with the pandemic, uh, what we discovered was that uh, we all of, a, all of a sudden found a lot of interest and inquiries from healthcare companies, uh, senior living, living centers and addiction centers and telehealth companies, because mm -hmm. by necessity, they all had to be, adopt telehealth or digital technologies much sooner than they thought they would have to because nobody could come see them or it was not advisable during the pandemic. And so they look towards technologies like ours to help them with that effort, patient engagement, patient journeys. And so it's a fascinating area. It's growing fast. Their adoption is great. And that's what we are um, focused on. Well, that's phenomenal. It's very exciting. Yeah. yeah, to your point earlier, learning how to pivot, right? Uh, Pivoting is, is important and a lot of companies that were not necessarily on the cusp of technology and technology adoption, the healthcare industry by some accounts could be described as a laggard when it comes to technology adoption. Yet uh, in some of the sub verticals, they're, they're having to pivot and, and leverage technology, particularly um, digital interaction for, for patient engagement, patient interaction in order to, uh, in some cases, uh, stay afloat or, or, or to reach their next level of success. So exactly, and so we're, we're servicing part of that right now. Yeah, we're servicing that. So it's very exciting because we get to do new things and it's very, uh, it's very, um, it's very good to see the benefits that we bring to our customers. Uh, absolutely. So, and I'm sure you've received a lot of great advice. Uh, but what is one notable piece of advice or the best advice you've ever received? Um, 
Well, I think somebody great once told me that customers don't always know what they want. Customers really don't know what they want. You have to tell them what they want, what they need. Mm. So I really remember that. And I, you, know, you have to take like, sometimes a lot of people will come to me and say, you know, oh, the customer wants this. And the, customer, the customer, I remember this person telling me the customer, the customers really don't know what they want. You have to tell them what, what they want. And so I've always, uh, I always thought that was very insightful. Of course, you have to know the source of that. So the person who told me that was Steve Jobs. Yeah. In fact, when you said that, that's the first person I thought of. Yeah. He told me that. that. Yeah. He Uh, told me that. And so, uh, you know, he wasn't, uh, he he was going through, he wasn't, he wasn't even at Apple at that time. hmm. And he did, he did tell me that during our conversation. And so, which was a long conversation, a few hours, we spent a few hours together. So I always remember that. And, and then every time, you know, people come racing to be the salespeople or the product people is like, oh, this customer said they want this and they want that. I'm like, do they really know what they want? So I always, I always keep that in mind. I think it helps me make better product decisions. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think one, one perspective is uh, the, the advantage that an entrepreneur has, especially if they're taking that methodical validation oriented approach to understanding the needs of the market is you're asking questions that are so granular and so specific that uh, the the general client or customer, they haven't necessarily thought that deeply about it. Mm. And perhaps if they did think that deeply about it, they'd come to the same conclusion as, as you're going to in order to develop a product or solution. So there's actually a very I mean, nobody, nobody told Steve Jobs that people wanted to use a phone for email, yeah. you know, and they wanted to hold it in their hand and watch movies and play games on it. Nobody told him that. He figured it out, right? No customer said, I really want that. <laughs> he told them, they, you want that. He showed it to them and then they wanted, everybody wanted it, right? Yeah, so yeah. He, he lived his own example, so. And uh, thinking about uh, maybe recently or, or again, something that stands out, uh, what mentor has impacted you recently or comes to mind? Oh, you know, I mean, I just uh, watch all of the, uh, all the, all, all of the people that we all watch and I just try to learn from them. There's so much to learn from everybody that you meet. So first, first of all, I want to say that I'm always learning and whether somebody is just starting out or somebody is successful at a young age or somebody is, is a well-known person like Jeff Bezos, you can always learn from them, right? And so, um, so I always observe them and see what they're doing and you know, why they're doing it and how they're doing it. And I, I, I'm, I absorb it and I learn from all of them, from all of the people that are successful and all of the people like that that are failing because you can learn a lot from failure. You can learn a lot more from failure than you can learn from success, actually. So mm-hmm. I, like, I like to just pay attention to other entrepreneurs and kind of learn from them, no matter what their stage. Yeah, and I mean, what would you say is a, is a habit of yours or a daily habit that contributes to your success? A daily habit that contributes to my success? Um, well, I would say that I... Um, I like to read um, a lot of, whether it's on the computer or in a book, I like to read about interesting problems and solutions. So I keep very much engaged with the current environment of what people mm-hmm. are doing. What are they listening to? What books are they reading? You know, what is their behavior? What are the new things coming out? I like to try new things all the time. Like I, you know, Clubhouse came out and I wanted to go in and you know, sign up for it and, and experience it myself. Um, and so I, I like to keep up to date with all of these things, keep being the know, I have a lot of curiosity. I'm intensely curious about things. And I think that contributes to my success in some way. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Always, always learning is, is where you want to be. It always yeah. keeps you fresh and, and on the ball. Uh, what would you recommend to people who want to do what you've done? in terms of entrepreneurial success or marketing technologies, if they wanted to get their start or, or reach that next uh, level of success, what would you recommend? I mean, I think what I would recommend to people is to uh, make sure that they are ready. 
So they're ready in terms of mental or financial, you know, position in, in life. Like you have to be, you know, you, you can't, you can take a risk, but don't take a, take a measured risk. Um, and then just go out and do it. I would say don't hesitate too much either. So whenever you feel you're ready, like you have a year's worth of runway or, you, you know, you're prepared to, you know, work with less money because, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it takes a big toll on you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I said, I had to give up very big salaries and perks to get started on my entrepreneurial journey, but I really enjoyed it. So I wanted to do it. On the other hand, if I had failed, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be out on the street, right? So I had made sure that I had enough cushion to help me launch my entrepreneurial career. So I would say take measured risks and um, make sure you research your ideas. The best ideas are the pain that you personally experienced, right? So I just found I've done multiple companies and the ones that really work for me are the ones that I have experienced myself, the pain, and that I have internalized that this is a pain and this is a solution. And, and, and I know the subject matter intensely from experiencing it. Those are the ones that I think are more successful, those companies that are founded that way. That's phenomenal. Um, and, and I know you said you're, you're always learning. Is there a business tool that you love using lately? A business tool? that I, uh, I'm sorry, I keep repeating your questions. That's okay. Uh, or a website, application, anything. That comes you know, I just read a lot of news um, myself. Yeah. Um, so I, I read a lot of news and I try out things like Clubhouse, as I mentioned, or any other new thing that comes around. Um, you know, and, and I, I wouldn't say it's ones that I'm on LinkedIn. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm seeing what other people are doing. Um, and I think those are the things that help you depending on what you're trying to get done. Definitely. I, I definitely want to share a bit of a curveball question here. If you had to go back in time and switch your career entirely, you could not go down the path of marketing, being a VP of marketing, working in the corporate world in that specific domain, what would you do? I'd be a doctor. How nice. What kind of doctor? Um, I think I would be a psychiatrist because okay. I love talking. <laughs> no. I love talking to people. I love listening to people. So it would give me a lot of communication, but I could uh, prescribe some wonderful drugs uh, mm -hmm. to people as well. So I would be a psychiatrist. That's, that's great. Uh, I really want to thank you for your time today, Anu, and um, provide you with... Um, an opportunity to share a great way to, for people to be in touch with you or follow up on any of your ventures and, and also a, a parting piece of wisdom. Sure. Um, so um, I can be reached at anu.shukla at botco.ai. That's my email. Yeah. Uh, so I encourage people to, and I, I'm also on LinkedIn. So feel free to reach out to me and link in with me as well. And uh, as far as, um, you know, as far as a, a cool piece of advice is, it's, I mean, I think I tried to pepper my experiences throughout this. So I can't think of anything pithy to say exactly right now, but hopefully they'll gather something from what I've already said. Phenomenal. Well, I definitely look forward to talking to you again and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for attending the business podcast and stay tuned for more episodes.